Broken manger, broken message. Before you here is a little manger scene. Sarah worked this morning so that we can zoom in on it for those who are watching and will. And for you here, Joseph and Mary. And here is the manger, except it's broken. Except it's broken. The top part of the manger where the baby Jesus is sleeping here in this lovely crystal manger scene, the top part is broken right at the head. We've had this scene around for a number of years as do a lot of things here. Sally looks around her house and finds things and brings them to church and, and shares them with us. And I asked her this morning, I said, where did that come from? She said, I brought it. I said, how did it get broken? She said, I broke it. We, she sits it here on the communion table during the Christmas season. And obviously anything that's crystal is rather delicate. So I assume it fell or something happened and it broke. Talked about whether to just throw it away or perhaps to glue it back together. Or what do we do? What do you do with the broken manger scene? What do you do with the broken manger? It's an inspiration that I had not had until sometime during the, the Christmas season, the Advent season. And it was sitting somewhere downstairs on a table somewhere around here. And I thought, what a message is found in that passage of Scripture. Because all we've talked about for the past four weeks is the message of the manger. The birth of Jesus, the hope that is embodied in that event. What happens if suddenly the hope is broken? If the message is broken? Lovely scene of Mary and Joseph standing there looking at something, but there's nothing there. What if the message is broken to us? I could suggest that we take some of that super glue and glue this back together, but I think we ought to keep it like it is. Because it reminds us that it's important for us to keep the message alive throughout the year. And how many times, for those of you who have gone to church here, there, all your lives, have you heard the preacher stand up and say sometime, we've got to keep Christmas alive all year long. Got to keep it alive all year. We've got to keep the message alive. Well, you've heard it a lot, but the fact is, it's the truth. We have to work at keeping the message alive. We're going to keep taking macaroni noodles to the food pantry. We're going to keep offering help when the Christmas crew is the 4th of July crew, if there's a need in this community. We offer help as we can. Everyone who shares, whether it's through a contribution, through work, through whatever, to keep this message alive. You never say, well, I can't do, I, don't, I didn't do anything. Well, yes, you did. Yes, you did. We don't know the people that, that came to the Living Nativity last week that we shared in sponsoring with the Catholic Church, an annual tradition. Tony's already, we've already had a conversation this week about next year. Listen, we're pumped. You know, next year Christmas is on Sunday. So we'll all hopefully be right here on Sunday next year to celebrate Christmas. The people who came to that event this year, how were they affected? How were they, you know, it's just something to see living animals and young people and children dressed up as, as they were in this manger scene to remind us of that message. I want to remind you of the message that's here in the gospel according to Matthew. We have been dwelling for the last several weeks, obviously, 
in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and in Isaiah and some of the other uh, prophetic passages, the Messiah passages. But this one, I think, is, well, not just this one, all of it, extremely moving. Chapter 2, this is verses, this is, are these, these are the, this is the 10th and the 12th through the 10th through the 12th verse. This is after the wise men have come to Herod, and Herod says, oh, go out and find a baby for me. I'd like for you to find a baby so that I can come and worship him too. I want to worship him too. And he sends the wise men forth to look for the baby. Here we start in verse 10 as they travel. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, the manger, the stable, the cave, whatever it was, they saw Mary and the child and Joseph and fell down and worshipped Jesus. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their country by their own way. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Here's the key, neighbors. Here's the key, folks, right here. It's not just that they came. They came and they saw and they were told in a dream, don't go back to Herod. Don't go back to Herod. So they departed, simply put there, they departed to their country by another way. We're going to find that scenario repeated when Joseph and Mary take the baby and they leave, G and, and they leave Bethlehem. Joseph is told in a dream, don't go home. Go and, and stay in Egypt. Stay there for a while until you are told to come home. And we know why, but we'll see why again in a minute. We've sung the songs. We've had the Christmas programs. We've put up the trees. We've shared the poinsettias, the banners, the beauty, the lights, the eating, everything that we did during this Christmas season. Now, today, the 26th, the celebration of 2022, 2021, rather, is over. The celebration, per se, is over. Soon, Tony and the Christmas crew will be taking down the trees. We'll be taking down the banners and changing them to something else. We won't be singing Christmas songs until we do Christmas in July, which I'm already looking forward to that, because we have that as a tradition here. Did that at a former church, and, and when the next minister came, people at the church said, are we still going to do Christmas in July like Phil did? Well, that was a bad mistake when you say like Phil did, because a lot of times preachers don't like to hear about the guy or gal that was before them. It doesn't bother me. I don't, you know, whatever we did, that's fine. Works for me, too. Preacher there said, no, it's not biblical. Well, show me in the Bible where Christmas is biblical. Does this say anything about Christmas? No, it says we are celebrating the birth of Jesus. Why can't we celebrate that on the 25th of July the same as we can celebrate it on the 25th of December? But our celebration, the big one of the year, it's nearly gone. And we're planning for next year. Do you still have your tree up? No, yeah, no. Have you taken the lights down? Most people leave them up for a little while. Other people I've heard, as soon as it's 12.01 on the 26th, they pull the plug and throw the tree out the door. It's over. It's just whatever the tradition may be. The trappings will be gone, won't they? But the message, the message hasn't gone anywhere. There's the question. What about that message? How does that message live on? How does that message live on? Or 
Is it like this little manger scene? It's broken. Say, well, it's over. I don't want to fool with it anymore. I'm done. Guarantee you, when you come around here throughout the year, you'll find this nativity scene hanging out somewhere because it stays around to remind us that the message of Christmas does not end with the 26th December. I went to bed last night about a quarter to 12, 10 till 12, and I thought, I'm going to stay awake till Christmas is officially over. So what I did was I finished reading How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> That's what I read. So that I stayed awake, and then as I finished the book, I looked over, and it was 12.01. And I thought the celebration, that the celebration is done. The celebration is done. The message is done. Here are the questions. One, how do we come away from this? And are we changed or are we unchanged? The wise men could have gone back to their homes. They could have gone back to their homes. And the message probably wouldn't have gotten too far. But they were told, don't do that. It stopped the rest of the story. Had, the stop, had that message ended there, I imagine what would have happened if they'd gone back to Herod, they wouldn't have gone very far at all. He probably would have imprisoned them, and he didn't want that message getting out. He didn't want people knowing that, that this young baby had been born in this little town and was claiming to be the king because he was the king. He was the king. It's just like Moses and Pharaoh, all of this, these, these, these stories parallel in the Bible again and again. Someone is threatened by God trying to intervene on the part of his creation. So the, the wise men, they, they didn't go. They didn't go home the same way. Verse 16 out of this chapter. I want to read that one to you because here's what happened. The wise men left, but they didn't go back to Herod. Verse 16. Then Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, was in a furious rage, and he sent and killed the male children in Jerusalem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time when he had ascertained what which he had ascertained from the wise men. The male children who were two years or under were all slaughtered according to the story in order to prevent this message from coming back together, in order to prevent this from coming back here. They were, brought, they were they, they, he wanted to end it. He didn't want to take a chance on it. How are we moved? How are we moved? And there's again, and again in the 10th chapter, or the second chapter rather, those verses, I want to just review them. I'm not going to read them to you again. They saw the star. They went. They, your favorite hymn, isn't it? We three kings. We could have had He would have sung that today, surely. Especially the third verse. Bob Weldon loves that third verse of the We three kings. They went. They saw. They went in. They bowed down. They brought gold, frankincense, birth. They worshiped. And then that's when they were moved to say, we want to take this message out and to take it into the world. The message wasn't stopped. The message continues. That's the challenge to us today. What do we do? Someone said to me the other day about churches, about what the value of churches, the value of the traditional church experience. Sure, it's not like it used to be, is it? For some of us growing up, church was the center of our lives. Youth programs, fellowship dinners, program, all sorts of things, all year round, all the time. The world has changed. The world has changed. We have entertainment at our fingertips with our little cell phones and, and computers and all of this. 
Our televisions can take us all over the world instantly. We can watch whatever we want to watch. We don't have to come together anymore. We just go on Facebook and say about our friends. We tweet them a little message. We email them. We IM them. We do all this TikTok. We know we do all these things. We are using every one of these things ourselves in the life and work of this church to reach out. We're using them because they are the way we connect. Well, it may not be like it once was, but I think it still has value in what it does to help you grow, me grow, and how we reach out into the community. Now for us, thirdly, what does the message mean partially? How are we moved? That's a question each of us has to answer. What do we do in the year ahead? How do we continue to, to spread the word, to share the love of God, to invite others to come, to join us, whatever the situation may be? Because the wise men came. They came and they were told to go home another way. And at the end of this story, if we are moved, we go home another way. We go home with a different message in our hearts, with a message renewed of God's love. The broken manger doesn't stay broken. It's back together. The message is real. May we bow in prayer? Our Father, we thank you for all of the great celebration of Christmas. I've had a whole lot of Christmases in the last few years, a whole lot of Christmases across my life, and I cannot say that I am ever joyous to see it end. Sometimes saddened, sometimes you think, I feel like I've run in a big race and I'm glad it's over. But nonetheless, it's fulfilling. The thing that's most fulfilling, most fulfilling is this story of the manger and Jesus coming to earth as a baby to give us new hope, to show us your love. Let it live all year long. The message does not have to be broken. The manger, the symbols may be but the message remains unbroken. In Jesus' name we ask it.